So Martin asked me to talk about PSC Essentials. And I'm not going to have very many slides. You'll be pleased to hear. I'm mainly just going to talk, and please feel free to interrupt. Um, so as Martin said, I'm a consultant here at the Queen Elizabeth. Um, I, with my colleagues, uh, Palak Trivedi and uh, Fiona Thompson and Jen, uh, we, we run a specialist PSC clinic here. And we also have an inflammatory bowel disease clinic that runs alongside it. Um, and so she's asked me to talk about the essentials of PSC. So I thought I'd take you back to A-level biology or GCSE biology, whichever you did. So bile. So bile is pretty important to understand bile uh, if we're going to talk about PSC. So I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about what is bile, what does it do, why is it important, and then we can kind of understand if it gets blocked, why is that a bad thing, all right? So bile. All kind of, most animals produce bile, actually. Um, and, and, and the human adult liver uh, produces about 800 mils a day. So it's a lot. If we stick a drain into someone's liver, up on the liver ward, up on the seventh floor, and they've got a uh, bowel duct completely blocked, that's how much comes out each day. And people get pretty dehydrated quickly if that's then coming out. What does it do? Well, it does lots and lots of things. Uh, but predominantly, I think its role is to emulsify fat. And what does that mean? I mean, you know, if you've got a really fatty dish and you put in um, some fairy liquid and you see it goes into drop, but big droplets, that's emulsification. And, and bile does that. So it takes little droplets of bile and turns them into big droplets of bile. And that then means the enzymes have got a bigger surface area to work on, 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 on that fat and, and break it down. All right? Um, so it helps with the absorption of fats. And some of you will sadly know that when you get bile duct obstruction, you then pour out fat and you get steatorrhea, which is fatty stools. And therefore, if, you are, if you're not able to absorb fat, you are also not able to absorb the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And so people get problems because they're not absorbing those vitamins. So vitamin D is very crucial for bones. Uh, and, and, you, and you'll know that hopefully your doctors are, uh, are talking to you about vitamin supplementation, so vitamin D supplementation. Vitamin K is really important for, um, uh, for clotting uh, factors. And so these vitamins, A, D, E, and K, are often lacking in our patients uh, with, with, with PSC. So that is, is bile, how much is being produced, and kind of the main things it does. There are a few more things to mention about bile. What, what, what else is in bile? So actually, predominantly, it's water. That 800 mils, most of it is water and salts. There's quite a bit of cholesterol in it. There are some bile acids, or other, you know, also known as bile salts. And when they build up in the body, they cause itching, a common symptom in, in, in patients with PSC. And then there's, there's, there's bilirubin, a breakdown product of red blood cells. Um, and and the, the final thing I wanted to say about, about bile is, is it, it isn't just produced and then you secrete it. Um, this slightly complicated diagram, so the, uh, you can, I hope you know which one's the liver, all right? <laughs> That's the liver up there, okay? Uh, I don't know if there's, there is a pointer here, isn't there? Yeah. Okay, so liver, and then this is gallbladder. And out of it comes the bile duct, and then that goes into the gut. So this is the small intestine and eventually the large intestine. So it secretes all that bile into the intestine. But actually, 90% or 95% goes back, it's reabsorbed, and goes back in, into the liver. So in fact, there's another interesting thing is that the, a lot is kind of going back in a feed, feedback loop every day. So in fact... There's an interesting thing. When, when people get blockage and you start draining their bile outside, that liver's having to work harder because it's having to produce more bile each day because it's losing it. Yes? Is it absorbed by your large intestine or the small intestine? So a bit of a combination, all right? It's absorbed in different places. So you can see this, the, it depends where you are, uh, but, it, but, it, but, but, it, but it's mainly absorbed in the lower intestine, okay? But 
Uh, and then some is excreted. So again, people will notice if they are not, uh, if they've got a bile duct blockage, that their, their, their stools or, or their bowel motions go pale. Um, uh, and so there is a reasonable amount. And actually, you pee some out as well. But when, again, you're blocked uh, with your bile ducts, that, 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 that bile then circulates around your, your, your bloodstream, and so you're then peeing out more, and your urine goes dark, and a number of you will have had that problem. All right? So it's, it, it, you know, I think this is, this is important. And then the final bit of kind of... Uh, uh, of kind of back to basics is actually the anatomy of the bile ducts. I think this is important for the understanding. So it's Im important to understand bile, and it's also un it's important to understand the bile ducts. So I think it, ca it can be commonly confused about where these things are and, and, and where do you get problems in PSC. So this is, again, the liver. And this bit, you see this kind of yellow bit of the bile ducts, sits within uh, the liver, all right? So it, we so often talk about it as a biliary tree because it looks maybe a bit like a tree. Uh, and you can see the, the bile ducts come off and they branch out and they branch out throughout the liver. Uh, so basically bile flows down these bile ducts, yeah? Comes out into what we call the common hepatic duct and this is now kind of outside the liver. Gallbladder joins up onto there it's a kind of a sump for bile. And you, as you know, you can do without the gallbladder because lots of people have had their gallbladders removed. The bile then comes out, common bile duct, and then joins into the, the duodenum, which is the small bowel, and flows out. So you are now armed with the knowledge, hopefully, of bile, what it does, how much is produced, and the anatomy of the bile ducts. So then we move on to what... So this is... In health, this is how the bile ducts work. But in, in PSC, different things happen. So we think, <laughs> we think uh, that the immune system uh, attacks these bile ducts. And it, and it attacks them differently in different types of people. But what predominantly happens is that within the bile duct, if you think of the bile duct like, um, uh, like a hose pipe, uh, it becomes inflamed. And so the hose pipe narrows down because it's inflamed. And that, can, that process, it can become inflamed and open up and inflamed and open up over time. But eventually, it becomes scarred and that becomes a fixed problem. And so you can get narrowings all throughout the bile ducts. So what we typically see in someone with, with reasonably advanced primary sclerosis and cholangitis are narrowings throughout the bile ducts. We talk, call it beading of the biliary tree. You might have heard that term. So it's normal, then there's a narrowing. Normal, then there's a narrowing. So all these bile ducts are narrowed. And we might also see narrowings of the bigger extra hepatic, so the bile ducts that are coming out of the liver as well. So you've got all these narrowings throughout the, the biliary tree. And, and that's what causes uh, the problems with PSC. Now, some people just have problems with their bile ducts. Some people might have a predominant narrowing of, of, of a, a certain section that might be opened up by a treatment. Some people also get scarring uh, of, of the rest of the liver as well. So we see some people where they've just got, not just, but they have uh, mainly a bile duct problem, but other people where they've got more of a problem that their liver also gets scarred as a reaction to all this inflammation going on. So... Uh, what problems does that cause? Well, you, as a group, know far better than me the problems it causes. People get pain. Now, it's interesting. Only uh, this week in clinic, two people I met said, oh, my doctor said to me that people with PSC don't get pain. So I think that's a common misconception. You don't get pain with PSC. Well, obviously, you do get pain with PSC. Not everyone, but quite a few people do get pain with PSC. Uh, uh, in the right upper quadrant, and for some people it's a really bad problem, but then you've got other people, they don't get any pain at all. Uh, what causes that pain? Well, sometimes it's a, an episode of infection. So we, we talk about these cholangitic episodes, that's really just infected bile. 
If the bile is not flowing out properly, it's just like stagnant water. It sits there, it gets infected, and you get infections. Uh, and a lot of people get pain in those episodes, but some people just get pain with their PSC. How do we treat that? Well, we're not great at treating pain. Um, the problem is we have paracetamol. It's actually quite a safe drug. We then have non-steroidal drugs that we're often pretty anxious about using, you know, things like ibuprofen in liver disease. And then quickly you go on to drugs, the morphine-based drugs. That The problem with them is the body gets used to them, and escalating in use of them causes probably more problems than it helps. So it's very difficult managing pain. Yes? What about CBD? Does that help the pain? It might do, but I don't know the honest answer. But the problem is all painkillers have side effects. Yes, of course. And it's always that balance, that you don't want to take something that's going to cause you more problems. Uh, and I accept that that's your problem, not my problem, but it is a difficult problem. And I've seen plenty of people take too many painkillers and actually ends up causing them more problems than you know, they're hoping to help. So that's pain. Itching. So hopefully I explained why you get itching. So the bile is no longer flowing down this, this, this trunk nicely. It is... It is, um, it is not flowing out through the liver. Uh, I'm sure Gary can explain what's going on there. Uh, so it's, it's, not, yeah, it's always the IT guy's fault. So, uh, the, uh, so the bile is no longer flowing out here. So in fact, it starts circulating around the bloodstream. So rather than not having bile acids normally circling around your bloodstream, you suddenly have bile acids there, and it makes you itch. There are other conditions like that. So, so I don't know if anyone's heard of obstetric cholestasis. It's quite a common problem in pregnancy. And, 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 and women who are pregnant uh, get high bile acids uh, and horrible itching. And as soon as baby's delivered, it all settles down. So if you've got bile acids basically in your blood, you itch. And so a lot of people with PSC itch. Um, we, have, we do have medicines in our armory to treat itch. Um, and, and, and broadly, we, we tend to start off with things such as Questran. A number of people have heard of Questran. It's basically wallpaper paste that we make patients drink. Uh, I have tried it, and it is horrible. But what, what that does is that sits in your gut, and it, and, and, and it, uh, it traps uh, the, um, the, uh, the bile, and, and then you pass it out, OK? And, and, and therefore, there are less bile acids circulating. So some people it works, some people it doesn't. Antihistamines, again, some people it works. And what we tend to recommend, because they make you feel a bit sleepy, to take them in the evening before you go to, to bed. Because often itch is worse when you're lying in bed with, with, with nothing else to think about. There are other things that we use, rifampicin, the antibiotic. I personally find that that's probably the most effective drug. Um, and it's a real shame when that doesn't work. But it does have its side effects. Um, there are lots of other things. Sertraline, uh, the antidepressant strangely works, and now Trexone, an anti-opiate drug, uh, sometimes works. I have to say, I haven't seen it work that often. But there are lots of things that we can try. So really push your doctor hard if you are having itch, because there is a, there's a real ladder of things that we, 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 we can try there. Tiredness. Sorry, you were going to ask. I, it's probably more of a me question. Than no, no. Um, my itch is still bad following vaccines. So I've just got naltrexone through. But that's, how does that interact then with the painkillers? Is it, is it then you're trading off painkiller okay. effects for anti-itching? Or is it not that? Okay, so, so who here has seen train spotting? Mm -hmm. Yeah? yeah? Okay, do you remember the scene where he comes into the um, A&E in a Scottish hospital having taken a massive overdose? And I remember doing this because I worked in a Scottish hospital and treated a lot of people with overdoses, and you give them naltrexone. Because it's, uh, if someone comes in with a heroin overdose, you give them the antidote, and he suddenly wakes up. Yeah, I think it's rented, wakes up. So you're right. If you, you know, Naltrexone uh, is working in itch, but if you're taking... Uh, opiate-based drugs, they won't really work anymore. And actually, a lot of people, because there are natural opiates that your body takes, a lot of people get those kind of cold turkey symptoms anyway when they take naltrexone. So I personally find that it's, uh, it's often its side effects are worse than, 
than, than, than what we're trying to treat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. So, so tiredness. None of this explains tiredness. We don't understand why... Uh, well, maybe there, there are theories, but we, lots of people with liver disease feel very, very tired. And pretty much everyone I see with PSE tells me they feel really, really tired. Uh, so none of these diagrams, none of our explanations, I think, help. And, and we're, we are quite powerless. The only thing that's ever been shown to help is exercise, and it's probably the last thing you want to do. Um, but actually, exercise, strangely, in studies, does seem to give people a, just a bit more. It's not going to cure it. No, no way. But it, but it does give you a bit more energy. But I think that's a really disabling symptom for people. Um, obviously, people get jaundiced. Uh, as, your, as, your, as your PSC gets worse, of course, uh, uh, bilirubin is circulating around your system that shouldn't be, and people's, you normally see it in people's eyes, eyes straight away. Um, and, and I think I've explained why people get pale uh, bowel motions, because obviously there's no longer bile in that, and they float because they're just full of fat. And, and, and we try and tell people to stick to sort of fairly... Your low fat diets. And then finally, on the uh, symptoms chart, of course, the, if those people who get scarring of their liver can get the symptoms of cirrhosis of the liver. And, um, and there we're talking about collecting fluid in the tummy, ascites, um, uh, losing muscle mass, um, uh, confusion because of toxin buildup in, in, in the brain. And these are really quite advanced symptoms and worrying symptoms uh, as the condition, condition goes on. And, 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 and you know, we, we can manage those symptoms to some extent, but they, are, they would be really worrying us. And I'm, I'm obviously talking about it later on around transplantation, but they're the types of things that really worry us and make us start thinking about, about transplantation. So the final bit, because I've got about, I think, 10, 10 minutes to go, I, I kind of wanted to mention... Was, was uh, as far as essentials of PSC, is, is kind of what do we think in the clinic? When you come and see Jen or Palak or Fiona and myself, what do, we, what do we do? Well, if we're meeting you self for the first time, the first thing we make sure is the diagnosis is right. Is the diagnosis of PSC correct? If you haven't been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease and you've never had a colonoscopy, we will book a colonoscopy for you as long as you agree because most people do have inflammatory bowel disease um, and, and it's important to find out. So we try and make sure that we get the diagnosis right and we find out as much as possible. We then try and stage the, 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 where the disease process is. And how do we do that? Well, we, we use a, there's not one test. A lot of people ask me, how bad is my liver? Is it 20% bad, 80% bad? We, we, we can't tell you things like that. We use a battery of tests. And often those battery of tests on, on a one-off clinic appointment don't tell us everything we need to know. It's often we see you a few times and we get a feel for which direction you're going. But broadly what we're looking at, we're looking at blood tests, and Palak is going to go into what, how we interpret those blood tests. So we won't do that. Uh, but, we, but they're very, very helpful telling us how the liver functions and what type of injury there is. We use something called a fibroscan machine. So a fibroscan machine um, uh, is a bit like having an ultrasound. It just taps away uh, next to your liver. Um, it's not invasive. And that tells us, uh, with a reasonable degree of accuracy, how much scarring there is in the liver. You'll remember I said that some people get scarring, and that, that is helpful, and a lot of scarring can be a worrying sign to us that, that, that things are more advanced than maybe, maybe we thought. We use ultrasound as well. We look at the shape of the liver. We look at the shape of the spleen. If the spleen's very big, that suggests there might be quite a lot of scarring in the liver. Um, and, and so we, um, and we, we can use an MRCP as well. Most, most people with PSC will have MRCPs, but we use that test again to look at the extent of stricturing within the biliary tree to give us an idea. But as I say, that, that bunch of tests on a one-off often doesn't tell us enough. I think it, you know, it's helpful to have uh, lots of time points and so we can start to feel what direction someone is going in. But of course, PSC is an unpredictable disease and sometimes things can get worse quickly. So we, we, we think about diagnosis, we think about staging, 
We then talk about surveillance. So, so how can we, can, we, can we regularly see someone and try and put off problems that might come up? So if, if a patient has ulcerative colitis, of course, we advise a yearly colonoscopy to survey for uh, bowel cancer. You'll know that there is a bowel, national bowel cancer screening program anyway, but people with PSC and inflammatory bowel disease have a slightly higher risk, and therefore they need that done every year so we can catch it early uh, and, and deal with it. We recommend an ultrasound on a yearly basis. Why do we do that for surveillance? So we're looking at the gallbladder in that situation, and we are looking at gallbladder polyps, or looking for them, and we look to see if they get over a certain size, because that worries us that there might be potential that they might turn in something nasty, and we need to take out the gallbladder. Um, a lot of people ask us about how often should I have an MRCP. Well, there's no real evidence about how often anyone should do that. Um, broadly, we tend to do it every three years in our clinical practice, not as a surveillance tool, but just to see where a patient is. But obviously, if things change, we, we, we book that test uh, uh, um, um, more quickly. Can you just explain, sorry, the MRCP? Could you just explain what that test is? Sure, sure. So an M MRCP is an MRI scan. Uh, uh, which uses kind of magnets. It doesn't use radiation, which is a good thing. And, and, and we use uh, an MRCP to look at the bile ducts in a patient. So it's a magnetic resonance uh, cholangiopancreatogram. I mean, so mainly what we are doing is looking at the bile ducts. The old days, the only way we could look at the bile ducts was putting a scope down, injecting dye, which is quite risky in people with PSC because you can introduce infection. Uh, so having an MRCP, which you can just go into a scanner, and, and, uh, and, and then that gives us a picture, that's a very, very helpful thing. So it's an, just an MRI, but just the... It's an MRI, but there are different kind of software sequences that give us these pictures. Yeah, yeah no, no, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good question. Um, so, we, so in clinic, we make a diagnosis... We stage where someone's had diseases. We talk about surveillance. We make sure surveillance is happening. We then go into symptoms, which I've already talked about. We manage symptoms uh, the, best, the best we can. Um, and then comes to treatment. So sadly, as you're aware, there isn't currently a treatment for PSC. But what we do have is we have Dr. Trevedi and... Uh, and uh, we had, he's not a treatment for PSC, but he, is, but he and many people around the world uh, are, are working on treatments. And we have trials. And, uh, and only this week when I was doing the clinic, we were, we were recruiting people for trials for PSC. And what we hope, of course, is that one of these trials will give us an answer or maybe just a bit of an answer. Uh, and, and we can start to offer better therapies. Of course, we do, in the end, have a uh, very successful treatment, uh, which is transplantation, but that only comes when we really, really need it, and I will talk about that later on.